How many of you have ever used Google Maps before? Okay. So the rest of you who've never used Google Maps, maybe you've used Waze, maybe you've used, you know, MapQuest, maybe you've used something else. You use Siri, which connects to Maps on Siri's platform, whatever. You've used a map. The funny thing is, the other day I was uh, trying to get to somewhere in Boston I didn't know, and so I went on to Google Maps and I popped in the address and I said, give me directions, and I hit go, map it out, route it out, and uh, I was confused. I was confused because it told me that it would take me about five plus hours to get to Boston. Anybody here been to Boston in this place? Is it five hours away? No. So I was kind of confused because, um, you know, I'm, I have a perception, I have a method, I have, you know, a way that I thought or a plan that I thought and how to get to Boston. And um, Google, you know, instead of just assuming what I was assuming, Google actually provided and recognized that there's actually multiple ways to get to Boston. You could drive there. You can take public transportation. You can walk there, which is why five plus hours was my result. It was set to walking. So if I left here at 6 Locust Street to go walk to Boston, it would take me about five hours, 13 minutes, of which I did not have the time to do. So I did not do that. I changed the settings and I went, show me how to drive to that location. I know most of us don't even look up the address beforehand. We just pop it in the GPS and we go, right? Um, I needed to figure out something, plan some other things, so I was looking ahead of time. But Google was offering me several ways, several methods to get to Boston. In our Rethink Worship series that we've been doing, we talked about a lot of things. And our core message has been this, that worship is our proper, say proper, proper. heartfelt response to God by which we place him above everything and everyone else. That is worship. We've talked about that, and we've talked about the, the marks of a worshiper. We talked about the essentials. We talked about so many different things of, of, of why and how come and all these different stuff. And so today, I just want us to look at Psalm 9, and I want us to recognize that there are ways for us to worship God. You know, we've talked about the what, the why. Let's talk about the how today a little bit. And uh, honestly, I, I, this doesn't have to be long because there are so many different ways that we can worship God. How do I worship him? I think that it's important for us to know this because the problem is sin has disoriented us. When sin came into the world, it set us apart from what God's plan was and relationship with him and abiding in his presence. And so it altered, it twisted the, 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 the manifestation of our worship that God intended to be the case in that garden and forevermore. When man would spend time with God and see him face to face every single day and give unto him the worship that was due his name, sin altered that. And so, you know, I thank God for this book that is filled with promises. And I get excited when I read it because it just speaks to me so much and it leads me in so many ways and it changes me and my family. And so I'm grateful for this book that God says, hey, I got a whole bunch of ways you can worship me. Let me give you a few. And he puts it in this book. So look with me in Psalms chapter 9. Let's explore just a few hows this morning. Verses 1 and 2, that's all we're going to talk about today. All right, just two verses. And it says this. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, and I will tell all of your wonders, all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask you, God, let it just become practical in our lives today. Do it again in us, Lord God, where you change us and transform us and lead us into your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, how do we worship God? I feel like almost kind of like this is a trivial sermon that I, you know, do I really need to preach this? <laughs> you know, how do we worship God? There's, there's, we just experienced some of it here today, but we've, we've probably done so many of these things and, and worshiped him in so many ways before we even got here. Throughout this week, we might have done so many of these different things to be able to worship him. How do we worship God? The first thing I see here, particularly in verse uh, 1 of Psalm 9, is that we give thanks to God. 
It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all of my heart. And isn't that connecting with the true definition of worship that we've been talking about? It is our proper response to God that comes from our heart. Our innermost being foretells us that those who would worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's with everything that we are. I will worship him with all of my heart. I will give thanks unto God. See, the King James Version says, I will praise the Lord. I will praise thee. The Hebrew word yada, all right, that word is trans, that's translated for praise in the King James. It means to acknowledge God, to acknowledge God for what he has done. It's an appropriate uh, fact then that so many of the Bible translations, the NIV, the NLT, and the ESV, and the NASB, and all these different versions, they, they tr- transcribe this per- portion of the scriptures as that we want to render Thanks. We want to give thanks unto God. Yada means to acknowledge God, to be thankful for him for who he is and what he's done. Has God done some things for you? Is God some things in your life? Does he have some attributes and qualities and characteristics? See, thanking God is all throughout the Bible. You can't get away from it. It's like, all right, psalmist, David, whoever you are, it is David who's the author of this one. He's saying, you know, you're the only one saying give thanks to God. No, it's all throughout this book. It says in so many different ways. Psalms 100, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless him. Bless his name. It tells us in Philippians 4a. All right, let's, let's go over to the New Testament. It tells us, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And that is just the tip of the iceberg because all throughout this book it says give thanks unto God. And one reason why giving thanks to God is absolutely critical and important is because it helps us elevate our God above our circumstances. It elevates God above all of the problems, above all of the junk, above all of the issues that are happening inside of our world. That is why it's important. So see, most people are only as happy as their circumstances. Can I get an amen? Some people, you know, it does not matter what has happened. You know, the best thing in the world could have happened, and yet they're only as happy as their individual circumstances. Ever show up to someone's house, I got a new car, I'm so excited about it. It's like, yeah, well, you know, that car drops in value the minute you leave it off the lot. And all they're concerned about is because they, their car is broken and there's an issue or, or their issue is happening or this happening in their family or this is going on in the world or, and this is happening in Florida and this is happening in this part of the, whatever. Some people are only as happy as their circumstances dictate. I found it interesting when Corey Ten Boom in her book, The Hiding Place, she shared a perfect example of this experience and she, she wrote this, discovering. Discovering their concentration camp was swarming with lice. Corey wailed, Betsy, how can we live in such a place? Think about this. This is a woman in a concentration camp talking to her sister in the middle of Nazi-occupied Europe. She's, She's not living her best life now, okay, in this moment. How can I be happy? How can I live in such a place? Show us, show us how. It was said such matter-of-factly, you know, that it took a second for Corey to realize that her sister was praying. More and more, the distinction between prayer and the rest of the life was just seeming to vanish for Betsy. Betsy was spending time with God. Corey, she said excitedly, he's given us the answer. It's right here in the Bible. It's right here in our devotions this morning. It says, rejoice always, pray unto God, and give unto him your praise. It's right here in the word. And God is starting to tell us right now we can thank him for every single thing even in this new barracks that we've been given Corey looked at his sister and is like what are you talking about she stared around and then looked around at this dark foul aired room such as what such as what and her sister starts going she says such as being assigned here together Corey bites her lip and she says oh yes Lord Jesus thank you such as your, what you're holding in your hand. And she says, as she looks down at her word, yes, thank you, dear Lord, for there is no inspection. When we came into this place, I get to keep this book with me in this place. And Lord, there's so many women in this barracks, and so many of them will come to know you because of this book that's here with us. 
Such as what? 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 Oh, right. What else? Thank you for the crowd that is here, that is packed so close because we're so together and we don't have any space and privacy for ourselves. When we start reading this book and we start praising his name, so many more people are going to hear. Why? For what reason? Such as what? Why should we praise? Oh, thank you, God, for the fleas. Wait, hold up. The fleas? The fleas? When Betsy said the fleas, Corey Ten Boom writes that, wait, hold up. Even in that? Yeah, give thanks in all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. It says, give praise in every part. For God works out all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for all things. And so we stood there between piers of bunks and we gave God thanks for the fleas. What a story. How many of us would be able to be thankful in the middle of a war in a concentration camp where everybody that has captured us wants our death to our lives, our families, our legacy, our heritage? Yet in that moment, she said, let's give thanks. It sounds silly, it sounds trivial, it sounds weird, but you know what? By looking for something to thank God for in every single situation, we're worshiping God by elevating him above our circumstances, church. And you can say amen to that. And some of us need to encounter this. How do we worship God? We give thanks unto him. And we can give thanks unto God in so many different ways, with our lips, with our worship, with our money, with our time, with our energy, with our family, with our resources, with our home. We give thanks unto God in so many ways because God has given us more than we could ever deserve. And every Everything that we have, if giving thanks unto him, it would not be possible if it wasn't for him. So we give thanks. That's the first way we can worship. And I see that here in this passage. And for us, I wonder, you know what, maybe I don't have a home. Maybe, God, I'm, I'm out of a job right now. Maybe I'm, you know, my family is broken. My marriage is broken. This is broken. That's broken. These problems are happening. You know what, but do we still have something to give the odd thanks about? Do we still have something to give God praise for? Do we still have something to say, yada? Is there still something for us to be able to say thanks? And I would say if we read Ephesians 1, if we look at God's word, verse 3, it says, Blessed with every single spiritual blessing in the heavenly places with Christ. That is what we have been given, a blessing. We have been blessed in Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing. I wonder, have you not been forgiven of your sins? All right, there's one person here that's going to thank God. Have you not been forgiven of your sins, church? Have you not been adopted into the family of God? Have you not been given the knowledge of his will and know where he wants you to go and what you can experience and what he's reserved for you? Have you not been sealed and empowered with the Holy Spirit that fills us and quickens us and seals us for the redemption in God? Have we not been promised an imperishable inheritance that no moth can kill and no rust can destroy? Have we not been promised some spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus? Yes, we have. And so all that we need to do is give God thanks. Friends, I don't know uh, that I have to stand here and teach you. Actually, I don't have to stand here and teach you to give thanks unto God. My son, Micah, my toddler knows how to do this. The minute my son grabs a a plate of food and and he puts that macaroni, that banana, whatever it is, he puts that thing in his mouth and and, and those flavors hit his taste buds. There's an explosion of praise inside of my boy's body and he does a jig. (laughs) My son starts dancing at the dinner table, people. He dances and you know what? I've seen my wife do it. Sometimes she's not paying attention and I'm like, I look over and she's like doing a little dance and I'm like, what's going on? I don't have to teach you this. We don't have to teach each other this. When we are grateful for what God has done, we give him thanks. That is worship unto him. So give it to him in your time, in your money, in your your attitude, in your attention. Give it to him in song. Open up your lips. You know, open up your life. Put it before God and say, Lord, everything that is in me, everything that you've given me is yours. I thank you for this, Jesus. I'm giving you worship. And that is so simple. It is so pure. It is so right. That is, you, you don't need to sit here and have a discipline dissertation on how can I worship God? You know, do I flick the flag this way or that way? Do I get down on my knees? Do I do this or that? It is give thanks unto God. If you start doing that in your day, at work, at home, in the community, you're going to start seeing God move in your life because his presence will inhabit the praises of his people. Amen? As you give praise to God. I don't know where that came from. Amen? But it was there. What else? 
It tells us here, verse 1b, I will tell of all of your wonderful deeds. We, we, give, we give worship unto God. How do we by giving him thanks? But we give worship unto God by telling other people what he's done. Man, we do this. This is how we worship God. Just open up your lips, open up your life, and, and just tell people what God has done, what he's meant for you, what he's done in you. Another way to worship him is just by doing that. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. Is telling other people really worship? Is it? If you stop and think about it. We tell people about so many things in our lives. Is it worship unto God? Yes, it is. Because it's the highest form of praise. It's one of the highest forms of praise when we get to declare what we've experienced. How somebody has impacted our lives. How something has changed us. We do it all the time with people indirectly. So why not do it with God? We do it indirectly speaking, not speaking to them, but speaking about them and what they've done. Have, don't we do this? You know, check your social media feeds. Look at your memories. Look at the things that you're posting, your status updates. We do this all the time, church. See, you know, mom comes by and, oh, I love it. Mom right now hasn't done this in a while. Mom, hint, hint. But mom comes by and she drops off that incredible buffet food, like that, that, that awesome, that, no pressure, mom, she drops off that incredible frango con quiabo, you know, and she drops off, uh, no pressure, that feijoada, she drops off, you know, that incredible, incredible, what else, what else do you guys want? Start giving me things, man, I, I need, she drops it off at the house. And then all of a sudden, man, I'm giving God praise. And I'll go on Facebook, you know, look at this. I'll take a picture and I'll put it up. How many of y'all got pictures of food on your Facebook, your social media, something? Come on now. What are you doing? You're praising. You're worshiping. You're saying, look at this thing. And you're giving glory and credit to somebody who made it. I'm saying in that moment, look at this incredible food. My mom is the best. She's a great cook. She's so good. She's so generous. She's so kind. She's so awesome to me, and I'm praising her indirectly. I didn't say it to her face, but I'm saying it by putting the picture up on Facebook. And I'm saying she is good at this. She makes this incredible food. And you know what? Not only that, my mom is awesome because you know what? Today I am not going to slave over a hot stove. Not today, devil. Today I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to enjoy this food because you've given me taste buds. So, God, I'm thanking you. It's worship. We tell others indirectly. Why not tell God? You know, have you opened up your lips lately to tell somebody what God has done? Man, I've been encouraged so much lately on my social media, my text message, my WhatsApp by Isabel Lima. Our sister hasn't been here. You know, there, there's, she, she's working in Boston still. You know, she's a nurse and doing all that stuff, and she's been online with us several times. But her mom went through a very difficult season. Her mom ended up in the ICU in Brazil, and her mom was told she wasn't going to live, and all these different things. And every single day, I open up my Facebook, my WhatsApp, or whatever, I'm getting Isabel indirectly telling me what God has done. Oh, very directly, actually. Saying, praise God, mom was eating today from a tube. Praise God. You know what God do today? God aligned her to the right doctors. Praise God, today mom stood up. Praise God, today mom actually opened up her eyes and followed a conversation with her. Praise God. I look at my WhatsApp and she's saying, God is so good that today mom is going home. Praise God that today mom is completely COVID free. Praise God that today God is doing an incredible thing in my family where we're united in prayer and God is moving among us. And she is blowing up my YouTube, my Facebook, my social media, wherever she can, every medium, she'll go and share what God is doing. Church, we do this. How do you worship God? You don't need a, a doctorate degree. You need to give him thanks. You need to tell other people what God's done in your life. You know, I just praise God that, you know what, this element of, of, of worship is individual with him, but it's corporate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. All right. All this stuff. Let's move on. Here's the deal. If we look at Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, I'm going to give thanks. I'm going to tell others. Go over to verse 2. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. One of the best ways that we worship God is through singing. It's through song. You know, it's not the only way. And so that's why we started this series and we talked about worship is not an emotion. Worship is not a set list. Worship is not coming to church and singing songs because that in itself, if we just relegate worship to that, we've missed the mark. That's why we talked about worship is the true and proper response to God that comes from our heart and it places him above everything and anything else. And that can be done in a song. It can be done in a thanksgiving. It can be done in our job. It can be done wherever we're doing. But you know what? One incredible thing that I see all throughout scriptures, it tells us sing unto God. 
Make a joyful noise. Declare his praises. You know, it tells us again and again, Exodus 15, 21, sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Psalms 9, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. He'll tell us in verse 11. It tells us in Psalms 47, sing praises to our God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises for God is King over all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. Five times, just in that one short passage, it commands us to sing unto God. Singing is incredible. It's such an incredible method of how in order for us to worship him. It leaves us encountering the king. That's why so much of our time as we come, as you, know, you step into an evangelical church, you step into a Pentecostal church, you step, step into church, a huge portion of the program, a huge portion of the time spent there will be singing unto God. Why? Because it's so impactful. And I love how um, Richard Foster says it in Celebrating Discipline. In his book, he says, singing is meant to move us into praise. Catch this. Singing is meant to move us into praise. It provides a medium of expression of emotion. Some of us need to get in tune with our emotions. Through music, we express our joy, our thanksgiving. If singing can occur in concentrated manner, it serves to focus us. We become centered. Our fragmented minds and spirits flow into a unified whole, and we become poised toward God. Did you catch that last sentence? We become poised toward God. Singing is worship if, if we're singing to the Lord. There's many of us, we will sing till we're blue in the face. We'll go to concerts and we cannot speak for a week after because we lost our voice from all the shouting. And let me tell you, we did not worship, at least not God in those places, sometimes. Singing is worship when we do it unto God. It poises us to focus on him. David said it this way, I will praise your name. So it's not just singing. Praise is not praise if we're just doing it for any other reason or any other way. Praise is worship. Singing is worship when we do it to God. It's this vertical thing when we do it for the audience of one. When we focus on him. But let me put a caveat in there. All right, because we're here sitting together, and it's, I'm not just talking to one person here. Though there is the audience of one that we're speaking to the Lord today, and we're here to connect with him, absolutely, each and every one of us, but we're also in a corporate setting. We're also in a place where we're together. And so in that sense, there is worship unto God vertically, but our worship, how do we worship when we come together? We also have to think horizontally. We have to think about each other. We have to think about the expression that's in the room here as well. When we sing praises unto God... It fortifies the church. When somebody picks up a flag and they start in the spirit as a prophetic act, okay? Like in the day of Jericho when they marched around that city and they were shouting unto God and they had banners and they were waving it. They were doing something in the spiritual realm that was undergirding and undercutting everything that was happening in the physical realm. As, as you come and you wave that flag and abandon, your life might be in shambles, things might be happening, but when you step out in faith and you say, I don't care what everybody else is thinking, I'm going to do this unto God, you know what? It encourages us. It adds value to your neighbor, to your sister. It adds value to the rest of the corporate body. You know, I'm so grateful that worship is not just something we do vertically unto God, but horizontally also. I see Acts chapter 16, a great example of that. When Paul and Silas have just gotten so irritated at this slave girl who was possessed by an evil spirit, who is, you know, divining things, having, you know, prophecies and, 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 and foretelling the future. Her masters got upset at Paul because Paul cast the demon out of her now this woman can't make money for the for, for her master so when they get mad and go to the authorities they imprison Paul and Silas for doing that and in that middle of that prison Paul and Silas they start in the midnight hour they start singing praises unto God now I think about this so many times you know they might not have been comfortable in that place I don't know what the, what the chains were like. I don't know if it's like the medieval times in the stockyards where your hands are here and your, your, your face is stuck in the wood and your legs are there and you can't move, you can't do anything. I can't imagine being in a prison and starting to worship that you are in a place where you're comfortable. I can't imagine that you've had all of your needs fulfilled. It wasn't like today in prison where you get three square meals and a place to sleep and you have your own private toilet and whatever. No, they were in a place that was very bad. 
and they were very uncomfortable. So Paul and Silas, they could have started humming unto God. They, start, they, they could have started worshiping God vertically in their minds and, 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 and just thinking and recalling and meditating on God's word, and they could have been giving him worship that way. But no, Paul and Silas, they opened up their lips and they started singing unto God. Why? Because praise is not just hor- vertical, it's horizontal. And I thank God for that because today in heaven, there is a Philippian family that is worshiping God and not in the pits of hell because they encountered the living God through the praises of Paul and Silas in that dire situation. It changed a family, a heritage. It changed people. So when we praise God, we do it unto each other as well. That's important. Worship that is solely cerebral is an aberration. Worship that's only in here and never lived out here, never expressed here, never shown outside of us is an aberration. It is not good. It is not. It's an abomination. Why? Because God put us to live in community. And so in that sense, church, when we study our Bible, you'll realize that worship is described in physical terms. If you go back and look at the Old Testament, the first word used for worship, we see it in the lives of different people. That word literally means to prostrate. If we look at other words that are associated with worship, you know, the the word for bless literally means to kneel. If we look at the word for thanksgiving, it means an extension of the hand. These are all physical terms. These are all physical words that, that connect with the physical experience of worship. And so in that sense, when we stop and think about, you know, I'm worshiping God. I could be kneeling. I could be standing. I could be singing. I could be raising my hands. I could be clapping my hands. I could be lifting my head. I could be bowing my head. I could be dancing before God. I could be putting on sack, uh, a sackcloth and, and ashes upon me as they did in the Old Testament. I am worshiping because worship has to be a physical expression. It's physical. And I wonder, all right, I'll park it here. We park it here. I wonder... When people make worship all about a private experience with God, all about a reverential experience with God, this is a private moment that I'm having in respect and honor to God. And you know what? Hey, praise God for that. You need to have these moments. But you can do those moments when you're home, in your prayer closet. You can do those, those moments when you're just by yourself at home. But when you're in a corporate setting, I wonder, if we claim that we want to have this reverential, this vertical, private, intimate connection with God, Could it be that maybe what is motivating us, that that reserved temperament, is nothing less than others thinking about us some way or another and we're worried about it? Could it be fear that's motivating us? Could it be that when we, you come in and say, I'm going to be reverential unto God, could it just be that we're unwilling to humble ourselves before God and others? I'll tell you a story, man. When I, when my mom and I came to this church, it was back in the um, 2007, 2008 area, Um, one thing Uh, This is not knocking any church whatsoever, but one thing that she said when she got into this place, she saw a man walking, uh, dancing here before the Lord. It was our brother John Anderson. I don't know if I told this story before, but John's dance, very humble, very confident, unfazed of what other people would think. That dance won over my mom's heart to say God's presence is in this place because here there's a people who choose to worship God and they don't care about what other people think. This man doesn't have a degree in dancing, and I don't know what he's doing, what motions and whatever. It wasn't the most choreographed thing in the world, but it was genuine and pure because he said, my worship is unto God. And so, John, I know you're not here today because you're with your mom. I thank you for the, for the fact that you did not worship just vertically, but you worshiped horizontally, and it blessed my family. When we worship church, we're a community. And it has to have an outflow in our physical expression. Amen? So today, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. If we look at the Bible, we'll see it all throughout. Did not David say, I'm going to be more undignified than this, and I'm going to praise God. I'm going to give God the worship that he deserves. It happens all throughout the scriptures that people could care less about what others will think, and they will give glory unto God, standing on truth, declaring, Lord, you have done this for me, so I give you thanks. I'm going to tell other people what you've done and who you are, and God, I'm going to sing it because, you know what? In song, there's emotion. In song, there's passion. In song, there is something that happens 
happens that just unites us and it focuses on, on you. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here. And I'm going to invite you, since I didn't preach for a whole hour and a half, that you guys still have time that you can actually put this into practice. So I'm going to invite you to step up and get out of your seat. I'm going to ask you to, to, to just shift your environment just for a little bit. Go to another pew. Go to, go to the altar. Come to this place. Kneel. Stand. Choose a different posture than the posture you have had all of this service. And let's just worship God for a few minutes. Let's put this in practice. Let us bless one another. And so if God has given you a song, if God's given you a scripture, okay, there is no formal dismissal today. You are blessed. May the glory of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and everything else go with you today when you are ready to go. But I'm going to invite you to come and let's just worship God today. His presence is here, church. His presence is here. You know, when Mark Twain was uh, traveling, he has a book called uh, A Tramp's Travel in Europe or something like that. I, I might, might have botched the, the title. But he talks about his experience in Europe. And, and he went to Munich. In Munich, he saw an opera. And in the opera there, he, he, he loved it. He enjoyed it. But he made an observation about the king of that country. The king uh, was a poet, was, a, was an artist himself. And he loved the expression of music and all this other stuff. But the, the, the king hated, <laughs> hated audiences. <laughs> And so after the, the, folks in the, the folks in the play, in the opera, left the stage and went backstage to remove the makeup and the finery and the clothes, suddenly there'd be a call from the matter d' or the person in charge, and, and they would come and say, the king is here. The king in this place. Put back on your fineries. Put the makeup back on. Come on out. And there they would have to do it all over again. There that they would worship all over again. They, there they would give unto God the talent that he had blessed upon them and they would perform before the king, the sole audience member. Yeah, in this place, there's a king here. And, and your worship goes to him first and foremost. You could be doing all of these things. You could lay on the floor. You can jump for joy. You can spin and dance. You can swing from the chandeliers as Pentecostals like to do, right? You could roll on the ground and do all these different things. You can do whatever. However, if you're not doing it unto God for the audience of one, you have not worshiped. But when you get here and you start doing it for the audience of one, recognize that the audience of one is pleased with your worship. And he says, I'm going to use this to glorify my name even greater. I'm going to use this humble servant of mine who does not care about what everybody else may think, and I'm actually going to make what they do make their neighbors think of how good I am because I'm going to apply it into their lives. I'm going to encourage them through this, and I'm going to change some things. I'm going to reveal myself. I'm going to do some incredible things among them. And so church, why do we worship? Because God deserves it, because he is good. How do we worship? We give him thanks. We tell others about him and we sing. So please, can we shift the culture in our congregation? Can we change the culture today in this age? It's not just about us coming and checking the box, but can we worship God knowing that we're coming before the king, the one and only audience that we need to do it for? and recognize that we're doing it before others that the king can impact. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. Lord, there's so much more that could be said. There's so many other blessings and benefits, so many other things, Lord God, that could, we could experience, Lord Jesus, as we see Jehoshaphat, Lord, experience victory when he worshiped. The Jericho fell when they worshiped God. The, Dave, uh, Paul and Silas, they were set free from that prison as they worshiped you, Lord Jesus. There's so many wonderful blessings as Hannah came and worshiped before you, God, and prayed and interceded, poured out her heart before you, Lord. She was worshiping unto you and resulted in her barrenness being taken away. God, there is incredible benefits and blessings in our worship. But Jesus, today we just want to do it for you. I pray that your hand would be upon every family and every person. Bless them and guide them in Jesus' mighty name.